morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me all and I hope you're all um, awake and ready for this 12th day of the Environmental Impact Assessment course um, here at Reykjavik University, which is entirely online this year. I hope you also enjoyed the seminar yesterday. Um, today, we have two special invited speakers. Um, like you know, the first week was mostly about theory and um, discussing the concepts of environmental impact. The second week, we um, had uh, we had some um, special invited talks from our Finnish colleagues from the University of Metropolia. And the third week, usually it's really hands-on training. Um, it's supposed to get you involved into in the uh, and in, it's supposed to get you into contact with Icelandic um, companies so that you can also um, see how Icelandic companies do um, um, circular economy and um, sustainable development and that you can discuss with them um, possibilities of collaborating for a master thesis or so on. So I don't want to spend too much time. If you have any questions, just feel free to write me a chat. Also, I hope that we will have some time today to um, have maybe bilateral meetings. I know that some students wrote me that they would like to discuss with me. Um, we will have two special guest in, uh, uh, speakers today. And maybe be the, between the two presentations, we can uh, meet in a breakout room and discuss the specific mm -hmm. questions you have um, and that you would like to discuss with me. So the two companies that I would like to present you today is uh, one is called Brandy. Um, so um, this is a very new company. It was, I think, established this year and it focused entirely on biofuels. Um, biofuels based on um, um, bio waste um, and is looking at methane production, ethanol production, methanol production um, and different ways of um, reusing the waste stream of, of bio wastes uh, and generating an added value. Adolstein Olofsson will be the presenter, but he, he will be the second presenter. And first, I would like to introduce Anna uh, De Matos. Um, Anna De Matos, she's, a, she's a, um, a charming lady from Brazil, and she established, I think it was a few years ago, uh, the Reykjavik Tool Library. It's a library that, uh, um, that lends out um, tools so you can repair stuff. You can also bring your bicycle, I believe. I'm not going to say too much because Anna will present her company or her um, nonprofit organization herself. And it's a typical example of circular economy here in Iceland, um, where you can um, see how um, you can establish a circular economy um, um, company or, or nonprofit organization um, based on a good idea. So Anna, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. So I think we're just going to jump right into it. Um, if you can share your uh, slides, you just have to press and then the floor is yours. And of course, uh, if anyone has a question, please write it into the chat of this Zoom video um, co conference that we have so that we can address it maybe after the, 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 the presentation or maybe even during the presentation. This is a bit up to you, Anna, if you would like to um, address questions right away or rather wait for the break between the two presentations. Um, let's, um, if you guys want to send messages over the, sh the chat uh, for any questions, and then once we wrap it up, um, I can um, re reply to them. Just do me a favor and write the slide the question is relating to, so then we can go back and, and check that out, just so we are precise on responding everything. Um, should I just start? I can't hear you anymore. So I'm guessing that's a yes. <laughs> uh, all right. So um, the Reykjavik Tool Library is a nonprofit. Um, circle economy, generally speaking. Um, Anna, may, maybe maybe you have to s share your slides. I, I know right. you prepared some slides. So yes, Young Shu, I you already shared. Uh, Oh, maybe I have to stop sharing. I think um, so. It might be that. And okay. Okay. Does everybody see the slides from Anna? Yes, I think so. Yep. We go a few thumbs up. 
All right, I'll go back into it. So um, the Reykjavik 2 library um, started mostly because of a um, personal need. Um, I moved to Iceland. I used to work in conservation and restoration of um, historical buildings and uh, restoration of uh, historical property um, in the UK. I lived there for 10 years before I moved here. Um, let me just move to the next slides. Um, So I'm just gonna give you a quick overall of what is a tool library. So a tool library, is a, a, we are a nonprofit. A circular economy, generally speaking, should technically always be non-profitable. Non-profitable, I don't mean that you shouldn't pay your bills or rent or stuff, I'm, because those things come at a cost. Um, a non-profit, I mean, in the instance of you don't want to make more money than you are, you actually need to spend. The reasoning for that is that that becomes a sustainable mo business model. If you have more money and you take that money out of the circular economy loop, you reduce in your loop, which means that, you know, technically speaking, you're removing money from where you could be growth for your business. Um, so we, we are very cheap. We aim to be accessible for everyone. So um, we can also slide our scales and, and charge less if we feel like it. Um, it's not easy. Uh, we are on year three now, technically speaking. So we, we crossed year three in August. Uh, but for example, July was the first year in the last two years that we actually, you know, broke even for the first time. So it takes it takes a long time, and we haven't broken even since. Then that's due to coronavirus, but you know, <laughs> baby steps. It works. Um, we have had a, a pretty tough year, um, but let me continue. With um, the applications of the the circular economy, that sorry, this is my dog. <laughs> he will, <laughs> he's uh, in frame right now. Um, so basically, um, with the application of circular economy, and there is a few things that can happen. So some people can call it um, uh, like um, an actual practical circular economy, which is why I would say we are. You, we are a visible circular economy. And then there's other projects that have circular economy elements in their projects. So they take parts of the circular economy and implement that to benefit uh, environment and so on. So a uh, tool library, a library of things, which is what we are, it's a completely circular um, circular uh, business. Um, everything that comes in stays in the loop. Um, so we offer access to tools. We also offer access to things. We also offer space. So we have a DIY center where people can come and do their own work. Uh, we also have a test shop, which is what we're calling it, or a takeover space. So that's in Leugeweger, um, where people can, makers can try and make their own store. Because right now with COVID, no one has money, no one has the possibility, but everyone still has skill. And people still have the ability of creation, which is, you know, really important in times of crisis. So um, we have this test shop. And then we also have now a co-working space for makers. So if you are someone that needs prototyping and you need to rent a desk space plus a workshop, that can be quite costly. So we make it really cheap. So people have the access to the workshop, a shared workshop and a desk so they can, you know, get their things moving forward. Um, we believe in accessibility rather than ownership. We believe that people should have access to everything without having to own it. Um, and it shouldn't cost them, you know, an arm and a leg to be able to have a tool. Most of the time, what you need is what the tool does, not the tool itself. Um, unless, obviously, you are a worker, I wouldn't recommend this sort of endeavor to someone that works in less construction industry, for example. Someone that will be using their tools on a daily basis, that person really needs to own it. Where the average person uses a, a drill for 12 to 13 minutes um, in its lifetime, which is pretty shocking. Um, so, we just try really hard at this point to just give people access to things. So I'm going to talk about, oh, did I jump on? Yeah, about myself for a second, which is, uh, doesn't come very natural to me. Um, 
as uh, they said, I'm originally from Brazil. I moved from there in 2007 and I moved to the UK. Um, I did my undergrad and my master's in the UK. I studied conservation and restoration of historical buildings. Um, and then and then I did my uh, postgrad in preventive conservation. And I mostly focus on analytical chemistry and decomposition of materials. So how does wood decompose? How can you prevent it? How does metal decompose? How can you prevent it? Um, and I focus on hard supports. So my, <laughs> my main focus was um, glass and metal, um, mostly because I did a lot of my research on uh, historical photographs, um, which is nothing to do with what I do today. But it is, you know, everything's sort of linked. I, I decided that I wanted to work with um, prevent conservation, which, uh, but I just directed that into tools. Um, we, I moved here, I had sold everything from the UK and I didn't have any tools anymore. And I wanted to do some work and I just couldn't uh, because I couldn't afford the tools. Um, and then in 2018, uh, while I was working, I got very sick. Um, and I found out I have an autoimmune disease and then I was in hospital for three weeks and while in the hospital, you know, the body is sick, but the mind doesn't stop. So I decided to start a crowdfunding campaign for this tool library idea that I had. And I made a website and a Facebook page and a friend of mine designed the original logo. And then after I left the hospital, I had the 1 million that I needed to start it. So it was kind of, I, I'm, I'm very scared of letting people down. So um, as soon as I got the money, I was like, well, I guess now I have to make this happen. Um, so I created a tool library to make sure that, you know, it was available to the people that actually gave me money to, to do this. Um, and then we worked all summer. So that was around May that I got out of hostel. And then we worked all summer. Uh, by we, I say, uh, me and a bunch of volunteers and a lot of my friends were just very keen in helping me out. Um, and then we opened in August 2018. Um, and it has been tough. It has been really tough. When I first started, I, um, I was also working part time uh, at Omnom Chocolate Factory because um, my grandparents used to make chocolate in Brazil. So it was a very natural transaction for me. Um, and I used to work part time there, so I used to work there until like two o'clock, and then I used to come to the tool library, which I found a place right behind Omnom on the beginning, because that was very convenient for me, <laughs> and it wasn't that expensive. Um, and then that way I was able to work uh, at Omnom and actually pay myself something so I could pay wages, uh, my own wages and rent out of that. And then the tool library was trying to maintain itself. Um, and then we had, um, we had a lot of success with grants um, so far. It's very tough. I apply for about 30 grants a year. Uh, I may get two, three, maybe. Um, if I'm lucky, this year we've been very lucky. I got four so far. Uh, there's more coming out. So I already got a bunch of notes this week. <laughs> so it is what it is. Um, but let's let's move on to the next slide. I talk a lot. I do apologize. Um, so under the tool library umbrella, the Munisapen. Munisapen means collection of things, which I found quite appropriate because it's what uh, in museums in Iceland they use for um, the, the inventory, which is what I used to work with. So I was like, well, that makes sense. Um, so Munisapa means collections of things. And now the tool library expanded into things as well. So you can also borrow camping gear. You can borrow a barbecue. You can borrow, you know, a baking tray, a projector, a popcorn machine, you know, whatever you need. Um, we try and arrange to make sure that it's available to people. The reasoning behind that is that those things are not things that you particularly need to own. Also, they're quite expensive. A projector is 90,000 krona on average, and you're going to use it for like, what, a day, maybe, maybe two. Unless, you know, you're using it at home all the time, I don't think anyone can justify that sort of thing. Um, we have then, and that's opening, the two libraries open Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday during winter, 
and then in the summer it's uh, Wednesday to Saturday to Sunday um, and we open from 4 to 8 p.m. It sounds weird that we open on those hours but to be honest most people work during the day so when they come to actually borrow tools will be after work and after hours works better for a lot of our members. So then the second thing we have under is the DIY center. So the DIY center is an open workshop and it has all materials, all, all equipment, basic equipment. We also have a 3D printer and we also have a small CNC machine. Um, we have band saws, we have table saws, we have sanders, we have a lathe, sandblasting machine, like uh, oven. It's like, it's very random, but we have all the things that you need um, to do anything really, or to begin with. Um, and that way people can just book a slot and come and do some work and not have to, you know, own all the stuff or, you know, is it the thing that in Reykjavik I realized very quickly when I was, uh, we started with just the tool library is that people not, don't only need access to things, they need access to space to be creative because a lot of people can't just take those tools home and, and make a table or you know they don't have the, the space um, to do that so we decided to offer them this and there is fab labs and there is maker spaces but we're trying to stir, stir away from the name fab lab or the name maker space and the reason for that is because those names generally speaking make people a little bit conscious of um of it. they they feel threatened by the wording because a maker space is like, oh, you have a laser cut or a CNC machine or something like that. And it can be quite daunting. So it's a do it yourself center. You come in, you bring your stuff, you do it yourself, you get it done. You know, there's no, no charm to it. <laughs> That's all it is, it's uh, the stuff is there, you use it. And then, as I said, we have a takeover space. So far we have fully booked for December and it's starting to book January now. It's just a space that is quite cheap for people to be able to, for people to be able to um, just try, you know? If you're a small business, you're just starting out and not, your only access for sales is online and your reach is not very big because you're not known, you need to have some sort of visibility. And to be able to have um, a shop in Leugerwege is quite impressive. So the idea is that we provide people with a space so they can try out. And if it's successful, then maybe, you know, they can try and invest and save money and do their thing. And we'll try and have the, help them out as well that, at that point. Um, we have Ringra Seferen, which is um, a project that I created with, in partnerships with the libraries. Well, originally when I first started the tool library, the libraries were quite upset with me. The dog fell. <laughs> uh, the the tools were quite upset. The, the libraries were quite upset with me because they thought that they could do it themselves. And then after a lot of conversation and questioning with them, they realized very quickly that they don't have the know-how or knowledge to be able to lend someone a saw with the risks that a saw represents, uh, and and with the right guidance. So they said, I said to them, how long do you think a uh, tool library? in a library will take for you to set up and they said probably about two years so I told them that I would do it for two years and then they can try after that and then after two years we decided to have a conversation and the conversation that came out is that they wanted a tool library in the libraries because it, it's about uh, not only accessibility but it's also about visibility and people uh, tend to not use libraries that much after they graduate for example um, and so there is less movement in the libraries and the libraries are very well known as a money loss sort of endeavor. No libraries are ever profitable, no libraries are ever make money, hence they are government owned or university owned. So we decided to create this project and the project I created with them is that I created um, and developed in partnership with uh, MyTurn, which is the software that we use um, for gathering data and uh, organizing our tools um, to create a kiosk concept. So it's a self-checkout unit, a little bit like the poster in is doing at the moment, where you can go there, you put your hidden teller in, 
you see the tools that you have available, you choose the tool you want to press checkout, the doors open, you take the tool, you use it for seven days, and then you return the tool. And the only thing you have to do is just press check in. So it's, it sounds very smooth right now. We're working on it. It's still a developing project. We are working on the API and the units. We design it as open source. So anyone around the world can make their own. Um, and the idea is, again, is accessibility and sharing. So we have no intention of charging lots of money for this. Um, and the tools and items that will be in the units will be voted by the local community. Um, the, um, and then we have repair cafes. So repair cafes are one of my favorite things about the tool library. When I first started the tool library, I went to Toronto uh, before I opened and I met the guys from the Toronto Tool Library and they were amazing people. Um, and they just, just got on. They have four units in Toronto, it's madness. Um, they have DIY centers and workshops and they have like over 5,000 tools and over 10,000 members. It, you know, it's amazing to go there and be inspired by them. And when I was there, they took me to a repair cafe, which was something that was quite new to me. Um, and a repair cafe is basically a community run event where everyone brings some food and some coffee and, and some cakes. And then you get your things repaired by people for free. And I was really shocked. I was like, why, how do you get it for free? People just want to repair things. It's like solving a puzzle, right? You get a toaster, it's not working. You take it apart, you find a piece that is broken, you fix it and it works again. It's brilliant. And there is no investment on the right to repair movement at the moment, at least not in Iceland. There's a big push in Europe for the right to repair. Um, so we just, I decided when I was going to open a tool library that I was going to run one repair cafe event on the opening day. And that was so successful that that became a monthly thing. And I have about 30 to 40 volunteers at the moment. Normally 10 to 15 people will show up volunteer wise. It's volunteering. so they. They come as they please. They will let me know that they're coming and then I'll advertise the sort of repair that is available on that event. Um, and we have kept in the, and we were unable to really be open the whole of 2020 for repair cafes due to the gathering bands. So we actually only, the last repair cafe was February this year. And until then, we have kept 642 kilos from going to landfills. So every time an item is, uh, comes in, we calculate the average weight of the item. And then we add to our spreadsheets to make sure we keep track of it. There is a tool, an online tool, where you can calculate the CO2 emissions saved from the repairs that we created uh, through a repair cafe page. It's not completely accurate. Um, but it's a good enough sort of thing for us to keep an eye on. So, so half a ton of, of trash stopping going from to landfills, I feel quite proud of that. And the volunteers love doing this and they're always asking me when's the next one. And, and so nice to have the community. There's a lot of people that come up, not even to get things repaired, just to have a coffee and hang out with us and talk. Um, and the whole idea behind a repair cafe event rather than a, a restart project. So restart project is a similar concept, but what they focus on is on the, the saving of the stuff to the landfill where we focus on community. We want people to engage with each other and talk about how do you repair this? What happened here? Well, you know, what's the issues and how can they learn those skills together with um, everyone else? So, we are um, pretty hot when it comes to uh, UN goals. Uh, we hit a lot of UN goals. We um, we give we adjust our membership costs um, to the disparity between women's and men's um, rate, uh, like a wages gap. We always have a little discount for women because there is a wage gap, man. So we need to do something about that. We hit a lot of the UN goals, and although it's very difficult to prove many things, um, we are very sure that we do. Um, I could develop a bit more on that, but to be honest, it's uh, it's a lot of information. So if any of you have any questions about that, you're welcome to send me a message.
Okay, so I'm going to play you a little video about circular economy. I'm sure you must be bored of hearing about it this week, but <laughs> it's a good one. Ellen McCartney is on the forefront of circular economy change. And um, I've done a, co a couple of courses from them, and I think it's a really interesting video. So let's hope it plays properly. If not, I'll put a link out for you guys. Living systems have been around for a few billion years and will be around for many more. In the living world, there's no landfill. Instead, materials. Your sound uh, disappeared. Anna, you have to unmute yourself, otherwise we can't oh. hear the noise of the-, the Oh, I did it one second then, guys. There's, um, there's obviously something on my share. Oh, here it is. I'm gonna, I'm going to do it again. Living systems have been around for a few billion years and will be around for many more. In the living world, there's no landfill. Instead, materials flow. One species' waste is another's food, energy is provided by the sun, things grow, then die, and nutrients return to the soil safely. And it works. Yet as humans, we've adopted a linear approach. We take, we make, and we dispose. A new phone comes out, so we ditch the old one. Our washing machine packs up, so we buy another. Each time we do this, we're eating into a finite supply of resources and often producing toxic waste. It simply can't work long term. So what can? If we accept that the living world's cyclical model works, can we change our way of thinking so that we too operate a circular economy? Let's start with the biological cycle. How can our waste build capital rather than reduce it? By rethinking and redesigning products and components and the packaging they come in, we can create safe and compostable materials that help grow more stuff. As they say in the movies, no resources have been lost in the making of this material. So what about the washing machines, mobile phones, fridges? We know they don't biodegrade. Here, we're talking about another sort of rethink, a way to cycle valuable metals, polymers, and alloys, so they maintain their quality and continue to be useful beyond the shelf life of individual products. What if the goods of today became the resources of tomorrow? It makes commercial sense. Instead of the throw away and replace culture we've become used to, we'd adopt a return and renew one where products and components are designed to be disassembled and regenerated. One solution may be to rethink the way we view ownership. What if we never actually owned our technologies? We simply licensed them from the manufacturers. Now, let's put these two cycles together. Imagine if we could design products to come back to their makers their technical materials being reused and their biological parts increasing agricultural value. And imagine that these products are made and transported using renewable energy. Here we have a model that builds prosperity long term. And the good news is, there are already companies out there who are beginning to adopt this way of working. But the circular economy isn't about one manufacturer changing one product. It's about all the interconnecting companies that form our infrastructure and economy coming together. It's about energy. It's about rethinking the operating system itself. We have a fantastic opportunity to open new perspectives and new horizons. Instead of remaining trapped in the frustrations of the present, with creativity and innovation, we really can rethink and redesign our future. So you can find that on YouTube. 
it's um their teaching materials are very open source as well um so now you can see my beautiful drawings of a circle and linear economy um so as they said linear economy is very straightforward you buy you throw away that's what we do as society that's what we've been taught to do i'm not saying that that's what we should do or that our parents believe that that was the only way that's just the way we've been taught to do it then because we're beings with conscious so we can change right we can choose to change um we can recycle things uh which is you know what partially what some countries do right now. I know my country in Brazil does none of that. But um, but in other aspects, Brazil has better circular economy than in Iceland, for example. In Brazil, most of the uh, soda bottles are glass and you can just take them back to the market and replace that and just pay the difference and you get discount for returning the bottle. So there is still like, even knowing it's 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 not um, as obvious, there's still aspects of it over there, um, because basically what was what is actually happening with the circular economy is that we're going back, we're going back to the milkman, we're going back to you know book buying, we're going back to the things that worked, and we moved on for convenience, and when we moved on to convenience, we created garbage. Um, so we're changing that. And the idea is that if we create uh, businesses that are circular from the beginning, from the word go, with the intention of being circular, profitability being a second thought on that. There is a lot of businesses that create, in, I don't know if you guys know Barna Lopen or Gringer Bazaar. Basically, those are, you know, you rent a unit and then you can put your own items there for sale. And those are circular economy projects. Uh, but because there was two that were extremely successful, now Reykjavik has six, you know, but people need to really think about before putting, it was like, oh, this is a this profitable, I'm gonna open another one of those. It's like the hotel situation in Reykjavik. Everyone opened a hotel because they thought it was a profitable endeavor until it wasn't, until we had a pandemic and there was no e exit of it. So before opening another thing of the same, how about promoting that thing of the same and then doing something else linked to it and work together with people. There's a, a big push for cooperation rather than competition when it comes to circular economy. You want everyone else to succeed so you can succeed together. You don't have to compete with each other all the time. You can just you know, wish them for the best. We have a great partnership right now with Fosberg Fosberg is one of the oldest tool companies in Iceland. And they approached us because they saw what we could do as a change. So basically what we do is that they give us most of the tools at cost price when we need them. And then our members can get discounts at Fosberg in disposable. So sanding paper, nails, the sort of things that, you know, you need to really buy. You can't really just borrow that. You're going to consume that once you're using on your, on your uh, projects. And we create a partnership together. And, you know, and, and that's how it should be. You should support each other and, and push people forward and try and help out. Because honestly, the more you help, you know, the more you share, the more you have not to be cheesy. But it's true, you know, and 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 the circular economy is a perfect concept for that. It's, it's like a community build project. Um, so how does the tool library fit in? So this is my beautiful drawing of a circular economy um, with a, a little extra steps. Normally, circular economy ha doesn't have um, the upcycle part of it or the borrow and return. That's something that we put it there. So by offering a decentralized, uh, centralized, sorry, centralized um, environment for tools and things uh, and equipment, you don't need to buy it. So you pay 12,000 krona for the year, and then you have access to 800 items when one of those items on an average cost is 26,000 krona. So, and then people go like, yeah, but I'm not gonna use it all that much. It's like, yeah, but you're still saving money, mate. You know, in the long run, you're still saving money and you're saving the environment and you're helping each other out. And basically you can offer to pay it forward. So if you have a bit more money and you want to buy a membership and leave it there for someone that really can't afford it, you're welcome to do that sort of thing. 
And that's the advantage of sort of being independent from the government. The main disadvantage is that we don't get funding, <laughs> which makes uh, running this a little bit complicated sometimes. We create less CO2 emissions. Technically speaking, when we receive items, they all come donated. So they come at us with zero emission. Um, so they start their lives with zero emission at the tool library. Obviously, they create a head emission from beforehand, but we, we count as zero from the moment we die. We have them. So uh, are they negative emission? Um, I guess it depends. It depends how person comes to borrow. Do they use a car? Do they use an electric scooter? Do they walk? Um, what are they using it for? How long are they, they using it for? What is the items? Um, so uh, what is the material made of? Uh, what is the, the life cycle that that tool is going to last? Is that tool is going to last two, three, four, five more uses before it, it goes bust and we have to try and repair it? We don't know. So um, technically speaking, in theory, we save a lot of CO2 emission um, from production point of view. Um, we save equipment from being thrown away. I may or may not dumpster dive at two shops. Sometimes I would deny it if anyone asks. Um, and we fix things that people throw away all the time. Um, and the intention with that is that we give in an extra lease of life to those items. And it's important to remember that people throw things away and they don't tend to recycle them. So a drill has metal parts. It has, you know, uh, some have like uh, glass fiber, some have plastic, some have rubber. All those parts are put in one object and then thrown in the garbage and it ends in a landfill and none of it is recyclable. Although I would say probably 50% of the material is recyclable in that tool. So what we do is when something breaks and we can't really fix it, uh, we take it apart and we put the things according to the recycle parts of it. Um, is there a lot of time and effort? Yes. Do we get paid enough for it? Probably not, <laughs> but it is what it is. You know, you, you do your part and you pay it forward and you hope that, you know, makes a difference. Um, so we offer everything at low cost. And the, the, the thing with circular economy is that it bridges a gap between social and economical value as well as ecological value. So we cover so many things that people generally speaking don't know where to place us. So when I ask for support from the city, for example, I ask for the environmental um, council or the innovation council and no one can fit us anywhere. They don't know what to do with us because we don't have a box. So right now what I'm trying to do and working really hard is lobbying the city to create a new box, to create a space for projects like ours to push forward. Because the thing is, we, are, we can do whatever we want. We, we can do whatever we want. People have this mentality that like, if you're not in a box, we can make it happen. No, let's just create another box, you know, and make more things happen. It's about the attitude that you have to approach this with. So I've been lobbying for about a year now and it's super tiring. I have at least weekly meetings with people where I have the same conversation over and over again. A lot of well done and this is a great idea, but nothing generally comes much out of it unless you have numbers. So the idea is the more people we talk, the better chance we have to create a new box for circular economy. It's sort of working. The Ministry of Environment has a new grant out and one of the options is circle economy for the first time ever in the three years that I've been applying for grants. So it's one small victory, but, <laughs> but it is what it is. Um, how am I doing with time, David? Am I? I can hear. Uh, um, I think we have enough time. Do we have a next lecture at 11? But you have enough time. You have 20 minutes left, so feel oh, free to. But it, I think it would also be good to give the you know the the, the audience time to ask questions uh, if sure. they have any. And okay, uh, how many slides do I have? Like, uh, <laughs> yeah, I uh, I talk a lot. I apologize. I'm going to try and zoom through those. All right. Uh, okay. So victories. Just go really quickly over this. So we have 200 members at the moment. We won 567 
and that number is specific number is the sweet spot between being able to pay rent and wages without a problem every year. Um, and then we have nine to 100 active members at a time. So active members, I count people that borrow things in the last three months. Um, we have over 900 successful returns. We have had one item not returned so far, but luckily in Iceland, it's very tiny and I got everyone's kind of teller, which means technically speaking, I also got the address, so I was able to go there and knock on the door and say, hey, can I please have uh, the tool back? And that was that. <laughs> um, we survived the pandemic, which is <laughs> pretty impressive. We have had two moves this year. Um, it's been really intense. It's been very difficult, but we've been very lucky. Um, we have had worked with a lot of kind people that supported us. The volunteers have been amazing, although we have had no repair cafes this year. They all, you know, got together and worked together. We managed to move to Leugerberg, which is not something I ever thought we were going to be able to do because the costs in Leugerberg are so high. Um, and we managed so far in the last two years to get, actually I need to update this, is 9.4 million kroner um, in the past two years uh, in grants, which is um, enough for one year. <laughs> so it's been, as you can see, it's been a bit of a struggle, but we'll get there. Um, we managed to pay ourselves salaries, which believe me, that is impressive, uh, is not an easy endeavor. A lot of companies have to find investors so they can actually get through year one, two and three. And we so far have had to have no investors apart from a bunch of grant applications. Uh, we employ skilled people that normally are unemployed. So right now I have two people in my staff um, that work 15% each. Uh, one of them is a graphic designer and she's been doing all the lovely stuff that you might see on our website. And the other one is a um, translator. So I need, because I don't speak Icelandic fluently and my reach hasn't been particularly good when it comes to Icelanders, mostly because it's very difficult to explain all of this that I'm explaining to you guys and then try to do that in a language that you don't speak very well. It's not particularly easy. Um, uh, we have a really strong team of volunteers that are amazing. I can follow those guys. They are, they make me very happy. Um, we are a leading part of the community. We are forefront of circular economy when it comes to Iceland. We push a lot of our um, knowledge uh, through lectures like this or through uh, workshops and and presentations and, and events that we run. Um, most of our events are free or pay what you like. Um, we try to do a lot of upcycling workshops and teaching people how to not throw things away as much. And um, we try and help everyone we can. So if you need help, generally speaking, people come to me a lot with problems and I help them solve them. <laughs> um, and that's how we pay it forward. We do a lot of, uh, support people in applying for grants. We help people with uh, crowdfunding a lot because we've been quite successful with that. Um, we help people setting up their own businesses, a lot of introductions. I, I like being a little bit of a bridge and introducing people. Uh, if you know Clarence Avent, he's my hero. He's um, like a music master in from the 60s in America and he basically all he did was bridge gaps and I love the guy that's basically what I want to do I just want to bridge some gaps um and and that's really it uh for our victories it's been a really intense couple of years it's not been an easy year but for sure we thought we were going to close in March and we the day we decided to close down is the day that we were offer a free space for the summer and we got grants that same week it was just madness everything just happen all at once. And then our main challenges. So we can generally justify large grants. It's difficult. It's very difficult for me to try and apply for a 10 million kroner grant, mostly because um, we are not profitable. A lot of the grants that are available are grants for industry and for businesses, and they're focused on what those business can produce, but they mostly focus on the profitability of the business without focusing on the impact. Um, so it's very difficult to find grants for that. 
a lot of the grants that are available, they are for short-term projects only. So I can only apply for a one-year project here and there. So I'm not allowed to apply for the tool library itself as a project. So it makes very hard to keep this funding. Um, obviously we have memberships that are pretty cheap and workshops, this year we have had no workshops. Um, so it's very difficult sometimes to be able to make the money that we need to survive. Um, proving impact seems to be difficult. Um, a lot of people are very doubtful of what we do. They don't understand fully or they don't understand why they should not own the sweet, sweet drill that they saw on Vico uh, <laughs> and why they should borrow that instead. Um, and they don't understand the social and ecological impacts that this has. So to prove impact tends to be quite difficult. It has to have um, long conversations about the subject before we can get anywhere. Um, be able to educate people about sharing benefits. Uh, just as I just said, it's difficult. People really struggle with the idea that they should borrow things. Um, and that's something that is just the mentality that we have had for the last 50 years, let's say that if you own things, that means you made it. So the idea that, you know, you need to move away from that is, is difficult for people because a lot of people's success or mentality of success relates to material goods. So we need to change that as well. Uh, convincing governmental bodies that they should count us as a basic service. I think two libraries and libraries of things should be a basic service. The same way that they have a library, we should have access to all the stuff because we don't need it. And if the government's not willing to provide us, then I am, but it would be very nice for them to give us housing, for example, or to at least give us support staff. Um, but it's very difficult to get the idea through because you, you have to remember the government body is dealing with maybe 20,000 people like me asking them for stuff all the time. So <laughs> it's, it's difficult to then try and get on top of that and on forefront and show them that they should invest in you rather than elsewhere. And sometimes because I'm, Jenny, I was like, oh, but that project's super cool. Yeah, you should invest on that one as well. And then I end up losing my spots on the line of investment from the government because of it. But it's fine. It will come around eventually, I guess. And the other thing that I struggle a lot is because I'm foreign. So to get support from the local community is difficult. I have, I used to have at least once a week an email complaining why everything I do is not in Icelandic. It's now maybe once a month <laughs> since I hired a translator. Um, but it still happens and people, uh, they, they doubt me because I'm not Icelandic. So the Icelandic person doing the same thing as me gets a front page article, but I struggle to even get the word out that we open in Logavegur. Actually, the day that we opened, an article came out saying that our shop location was empty. So it's, it's a massive struggle. Um, and a lot of the times people think that I sound patronizing or that I'm edu trying to educate them on something that I don't, is not my place to do so, which is very narrow-minded vision, which I'm not trying to be patronizing. I'm giving them an option. If they don't want to take it, that's fine. But that doesn't mean I'm going to go away. So it's, it's just difficult. Um, what else? So this is the thing. We struggle with grants, we struggle with governmental bias, we struggle to show the our impact. So we really want to uh, do some research on the CO2 emissions saved and carbon footprint of the tools that we have. So we would like to do a research project that would um, check the emissions of the top 50, uh, 10 to 50 most borrowed tools and items in the tool library. So all the way from the production line emission to getting to us as zero and what emissions are created or absorbed or negative, whichever you want to call it, um, once they are bought. And by borrowing, do you create more emission? Do you reduce the emission? What is the comparability between someone's item in the closet gathering dust and something that is bored all the time? Um, in theory, when something arrives at us because it's carbon neutral, um, then um, we, we would technically see us as negative carbon emission, although that will highly depend on 
how a person came to borrow the item, how what they're using it for, and so on. And those are data that we have, but we don't have any analysis of it. I have all the numbers of how many items have been borrowed, where they come from, uh, their origins, all the sort of data. We just have it, but we just have no way of doing anything with it because I'm not a scholar. I am <laughs> a doer. Uh, it's, it's different. I, I can't, I don't have the mind space to do what you guys do. Um, and this is something that we would like to, in the future, develop a partnership with RU um, to be able to check those emissions. And this is why David invited me to do this lecture, because it's very similar concept to what the, the, this uh, course that you guys are doing with him right now to understand the, the traceability of things and the impacts that their CO2 emission and, and their carbon emission is, um, is created or diluted by the act of borrowing. Um, and, you know, if you would like to help us and you'd like to work with us or volunteer, or if you have any questions and want to help us reach the 2040 targets of being carbon neutral in Reykjavik, you know, this could be an opportunity for you. And this is um, something that we're trying really hard. We have all the data for Repair Cafes as well. Um, and all the information is just going to keep growing. We have a big year plan ahead of us and it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, so I'm going to stop talking now and let you guys ask questions if you have any. Do I have time today over? Yes, we have about nine minutes to the next okay. speaker. So if All anyone right. has a question, um, please feel free to just unmute yourself and ask it. Maybe I'm just gonna have a short intermediate question for the students to, yeah. if they were thinking about the question. So. Um, I know we talked about it before, and um, previously, you, previously you had a um, bicycle repair shop every spring. Um, yeah. Do you still have this? And um, can you can students still bring their bicycles to uh, um, repair their bicycles? Or so we do. On, we do bike repairs for free on the repair cafe. I have four volunteers that repair bikes for free. So the only thing you have to do is bring your material. So if you need, if you bust your wheel bring a new one and we will replace it for you. As long as there is no cost, like we can't really buy the equipment for you. But we generally speaking have a lot of old bikes that we kind of strip them up <laughs> and upcycle them into new bikes. Um, and we have a good partnership with uh, Dr. Bike and they do workshops. They used to do, they haven't done it since last year, obviously because of all of this, um, where they teach people how to maintain and repair things themselves. So we do that um, members pay cost price. So it's about, I think is uh, 2,800 for a member. And then non-members pays cost price plus rent, which is works out about 3,500, 4,000. Um, so we try our best to, to not have much uh, money involved in events like this but it's necessary to pay the person who is teaching us. So yeah, that's, uh, that's where it goes. Any questions from the audience? Otherwise I'm just gonna, maybe not a question, but rather a, um, um, a comment to your last slide, how you would like to collaborate with Reykjavik University. Um, yeah. So this is a little bit the, the interesting aspect of from the scientific point of view, um, I mean, we have seen in the first lecture that Iceland has the highest ecological footprint per capita. Um, yeah. And it's partially due to the smelters that are located in Iceland. There's a lot of heavy industry in, in Iceland per capita, but it's also partially due to, um, because there seems to be a very consumer oriented society where a lot, a lot of um, material is being bought. And um, it seems like there's little recycling. There are a lot more recycling or, um, or, or um, tool factories in initiatives than in other parts of the world. And so one interesting question would be how exactly does uh, an initiative like Anna has been doing in the last years, how does this affect the ecological footprint of the average Icelander if you were to upscale it to, an ice, to, to the whole country and if you were to create something that is even bigger than, than already exists? So if anyone is interested in looking into this, um, we would team up, I believe, with a professor from Howie, right? Um, mm -hmm. Anna, yeah, Yuka. Maybe, 
you can and we, we could this could be a, a very nice student project where you could look into um, by taking the model that Anna has created and um, applying it to the to the in a, in a larger scale how much could you reduce the, car, the, the ecological footprint or also the carbon footprint uh, um, if you take this model and you upscale it to a uh, whole society which we already are technically doing with the self-checkout unit. So we have one unit that is going to go in Copenhagen, hopefully February. We're about four weeks delay on our uh, project. Um, and then we apply for a grant with the city of Reykjavik and we'll have one in Brejo and one in Kringland as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then hopefully we'll have more around the country. The aim is next year is to push that forward and get those units because they're prototypes. So get them tested and see how they work adjust and adapt to whatever we need to do for them um, for the following year. So we have plenty of data. <laughs> yes. So if anyone is interested in, in, in getting involved in a project like this, um, feel free to contact Anna or, or myself, and then we can see how we can proceed, take the next steps. Does anyone have, have any questions? Oh, silence. Uh, what are the like the most expensive things that you're renting out to the cost? No, I have a 3D printer and that's two and a half grand um, a pound. Sorry, I do a lot of pounds <laughs> money. Um, so that's two and a half thousand pounds and people have accessibility to that. Um, we have tools that are 200,000 kroner. We have tools that are 600 kroner. The, the price range, I would say, is about 30 to 40,000 per on the tools. Right. Do you buy it all by yourself or is it like... No, it's all donation. All I, donation haven't bought, sorry. I haven't bought right. anything. I have over 100 items at the moment. Right. Um, oh. And it's all been donated to us. I have bought a few things. And those are the things that people really request a lot and we can't like we can't get it, them donated because all they are expensive items or um, it's just limited amounts in Iceland. So generally speaking, I try and source those out, hence the partnership with Forsberg or I just buy secondhand really. We just recently got a um, carpet cleaner. So, so I, I can... I can tell you my own experience. I think it was three years ago. Um, I have a Beamer. I don't have a television at home. I, I have a Beamer so I, to, to make home video. Uh, and um, my Beamer broke down. And did, I had to replace somehow the, the, the bulb in the Beamer. So mm -hmm. I looked for a replacement of it. And it seemed to be very expensive in Iceland to repair this, uh, to, get the, the, to get the replacement piece. And I wasn't able to find a company that could provide me exactly this piece. And since I'm not a really a electrical engineer, I, I just I, I went to the um, to, to the repair coffee, and actually I just donated it because for me it was somehow easier. <laughs> I have to admit to buy a new Beamer, and then I donated it to the to the tools tool library. And maybe maybe this maybe this was one way how you could repair it and then make it available to other people uh, and. Well, to be honest, I remember this now, and that was taken apart <laughs> for oh, okay. being made into other things, mostly because it was we the lamp itself, the bulb itself was quite expensive. Yeah. Okay. But but, but the, it's being used, and we still have it. We still have parts of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good to know. Good to know. So I think we're going to give a big applause to Anna for her presentation. Um, which is a very community-based, a very helpful um, initiative. Um, we'll have a short break and then we start as soon as our next speaker is available. Thank you, Anna, for joining us um, and we'll be in touch. for No problem. Thank blabbing. you very much, guys. Thanks. Thank sorry, sorry about all the blabbing. <laughs> right. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Hi, David. How are you? Um, hello. Now, who, who is speaking? <laughs> it's Tim Bishop here from the UK. 
I'm working with Averstedt on the Brenni project. Oh, okay, great. Nice to meet you, Tim. Are you going to present today? Yeah, it's going to be both myself and Averstedt that are, are presenting this morning. Yeah, Excellent. he's just arrived. Excellent. Yay. We just, look like a pair of grown-ups with our glasses yes. on. Okay. Okay, very good. Nice to meet you. I haven't met you before. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so we have a short break. It's already 11 o'clock, so we're going to go right ahead with the next presentation. The next presentation is Adelstein, and apparently, like I just met Timothy mm -hmm. um, from the UK, um, they have developed a new company. They established a new, new company called Brenny.is. And what they want to do, they want to promote the utilization of um, biofuels or the promotion of um, selling biofuels in Iceland. Um, it's a real, very interesting project because this could create carbon neutral or at least low carbon um, um, fuels for, for cars, for any combustion engine uh, and for other uses as, as well. So it's really an emerging um, technology. We have heard it as well yesterday in the lecture from the European commissioner. Um, who, who was promoting that hydrogen and other biofuels are a big part of the Green Deal. So I don't want to talk much more. Um, and I want to give the floor to Adelstein and his colleague, Timothy. Um, and so please feel free to share your slides and I will um, stop share, sharing my slides. So, so David, we, we, can, we can help you out a little bit here um, because we know that Icelandic is a very entertaining language to, um, to speak. And uh, his name is actually Arvelstedt. And because it's got that really difficult Icelandic stedt noise in it, what we do is we just translate it literally into English and we just call him Mainstone. Okay. It's much easier. Yeah. So his, okay. his email address is actually mainstone at gmail.com. Okay. So just, just call him Mainstone. It's, it's so much easier. <laughs> I will do that. Thank you. So please. You're muted. Uh, um, I bit. think best is if you would share your, I think you prepared some slides and if yeah. you- Yeah, shall I share mine or are you going to share yours? What do you want to do? I'm going to share. You share yours and then we need, when we need to move forward, you can do that. Cool. So how, do you see, see the slides? Perfect. Okay. Yeah, so uh, the Brenne uh, company is actually <laughs> the two of us. Don't give that away. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't really bigger yet, but we need more people. So today uh, uh, we are going to present this in like two parts. Um, it's about uh, biofuels. Uh, and first, uh, I'm going to talk about my master's thesis in environment and natural resources at the University of Iceland which I finished just early this year. And then uh, we'll talk about Brenni, the, the company or the project and, and our future plans. And in the end, we'll talk about uh, uh, how people can get involved, especially students. Should we, um, should we maybe tell the, the good people who we are and why we're brilliant at this project? Ah, uh, yeah. So much fun to talk about ourselves. Should we, should we have some fun? I'll introduce you if you introduce me. How about that? <laughs> okay, I'm so sure. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah so Adelstedt is, um, we, we, we met uh, in 2003 when I moved to Iceland. We were both working together in a company called Vaki in Kobovort. Um, he's uh, an electronic engineer and an engineer and a bit of a mathematician. Um, and uh, and like myself, is a mediocre but enthusiastic snowboarder and a connoisseur of single malt. Okay. <laughs> uh, some of this is, this is true. Yeah. Some of this. It's all true. <laughs> yeah, and we've done a lot of things since then. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're good friends and trust each other. So therefore we are ended up with this project. Uh, Timothy is, uh, he is the project manager of this. I'm, I'm more of on the theory side, Boy. science stuff. So, uh, yeah, Timothy is more of a people's person. I'm, I'm more of a 
uh, and the engineer. <laughs> That's about right, actually. Yeah, I should probably add that I'm, you know, an, an, an ex-professional aviator, um, uh, ex-Royal Navy officer, uh, software engineer, and these days I specialize in um, uh, project management for software projects using methodology, modern methodologies, for example, Agile. Yeah, but we're trying to use Agile methods in this project. We're doing very well. We meet once a week and we discuss results and I tell you what to do. Uh, yeah, yeah, Alfram. Exactly. So, uh, uh, what led up to this Brandy thing was that I, uh, I was studying uh, at the University of Iceland and I uh, made a, a master's thesis about the ways or how we could uh, uh, transition to uh, renewable fuels in transportation in Iceland. This is much talked about energy transition in transport. And this uh, uh, means that we want to use domestic uh, energy for cars and ships in Iceland. And uh, so I, the research question was uh, broken into three uh, questions. That is, what fuels can we use? Uh, uh, and how much energy and, and raw materials do we have to produce these fuels? And how does this compare to what we're using of energy today? Uh, and you can look up this uh, thesis uh, in Schema. Um, so first I looked at what uh, fuels and energy carriers are actually in the literature and discussed. And um, uh, one of the most impo important metrics when you talk about uh, fuels for for transportation is the energy density and this is a, a like a list of uh, the fuels I, I, I considered and it's mostly hydro hydrocarbons um, we can uh, produce diesel and gasoline uh, from renewable sources um, well known is of course biodiesel uh, and uh, then we have other more like unusual things like butanol it's actually uh, uh, very similar to gasoline uh, and better for gasoline engines than for example ethanol and methanol um, then we have this strange thing D-methyl ether, or DME, it's been, it has been discussed for many years because it can be produced from methanol in a, in a very simple way, and it's excellent fuel for diesel engines. Uh, it's actually uh, uh, it's gaseous, um, but it's easily compressed and easily stored. Uh, then we have the common alcohols, ethanol, methanol. Uh, uh, ethanol is very, yeah, it's a, it's a common biofuel. Just look at Brazil where ethanol is, is uh, widespread. Um, then I, I come up with a uh, I put in the list uh, a new new fuel, uh, oxymethylene ethers or OME. Um, this is a uh, big brother of DME. Uh, it's just longer chains. It's produced from methanol and it's liquid at, at atmospheric pressure and it's uh, excellent for diesel engines. Um, methane is in the list. Uh, it's difficult to 
compress, but it has very high energy density. But in container, it has uh, lower, if, yeah, if we take the container with the weight of the fuel, the energy density is less than of, of other hydrocarbon fuels. Uh, same goes for hydrogen, which is has a very high energy density, but it has to be compressed into a container. And then with the container, the energy density is much lower. But still, it's, it's quite good in that matter. Um, and just for fun, I, I considered uh, compressed air. Uh, it has actually, yeah, well, not very high energy density, but it has been considered for vehicles. Uh, but with, with container, the energy density is much less than I show here on the graph. So, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, and the engines are, are problematic and, and have low uh, efficiency. So it is really not an option. And then we are down to uh, the common lithium battery that are used in cars today. And you see that the energy density is very low. And there we have these range problems with, with battery electric vehicles. Um, and then uh, I'm down to flywheels and ultra capa capacitors and superconductors. And these things just have very low energy density and, and they cannot be considered for, for transportation use. Um, one thing I want to point out here is that uh, uh, all the energy carriers uh, or fuels, if you like, uh, that we really consider for, for transportation are chemical fuels because the electrochemical battery is actually storing energy in chemical form. So we get it out in, as electricity. Uh, another thing I just didn't take uh, into this list is uh, our fuels based on nitrogen. Uh, we could, and it has been discussed to, to uh, produce uh, hydrogen and connect with nit nitrogen. Uh, but these fuels are problematic and like ammonia and they will probably not become anything, but but they are they are there. So let's move on. Uh, I, can I quickly knit back a slide, if that's okay? Yeah. Just go back. So I'm going to ask some dumb questions. Yeah. So first thing is, what is actually the Icelandic word that we use for energy density? Is it orka uh, Yes. Yeah. I yeah. Say so. Yeah. Yeah. So if I'm if I'm judging this right, probably the key concept that we have here is that there are super efficient ways of storing energy. But as mm -hmm. soon as you have to physically move them, the whole problem gets a great deal worse. Yeah. So the transportation model is what makes it difficult. Yeah. Um, and a classic case of this, um, if you look down at the flywheels and the supercapacitors, I know, for example, there are systems where they store energy by, by towing concrete blocks up to the top of a train track and letting it come down slowly. In Wales, about two hours over there, there's a mountain called Drosvinith, where for about 50 years now, there's a lake on top of the mountain uh, and a hydroelectric plant. And at night, when the energy is cheap, they pump all the water to the lake at the top of the, the, the mountain. And during the day, when everybody puts their kettle on and makes their English cup of tea, they, they allow the water to come back down. And it's purely renewable energy. It's incredibly efficient. Uh, but it only works because you never actually have to move the mountain. Yeah. And, and grid ele electricity storage is, is a big thing, and it's quite different from yes. transportation. It's, 
It's the transportation that adds a whole layer of difficulty to the problem. Yeah. And we'll come better into that later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and, and we have to be able to uh, find out uh, how we're going to produce these fuels to answer the, the questions posed earlier. So these are the main processes. It's really uh, biofuels and electric fuels. And then not shown here are the uh, is charging of batteries. So I'll just go quickly through this. Uh, on, the, on the right, we have biological route, which mostly fermentation uh, that is used to produce uh, typically ethanol and methane. Uh, butanol and hydrogen can also be, be produced. Then uh, next is a thermochemical route where we break down the biomass either into synthetic gas or syn gas or bio oil. Uh, and then from the syncas or the bio, bio oil, uh, we produce fuels. And you see the red arrow there, there's uh, uh, also this, uh, this process of using vegetable oil and producing either biodiesel or hydro-treated hydro vegetable oil. Um, that's kind of a part of the thermochemical, thermochemical route. And some of these processes use hydrogen, uh, like the process we are going to discuss later. And uh, byproduct of, of the, the biofuels pro processes is typically carbon dioxide. And then on the left, there's this interesting path uh, of electrofuels. Uh, which is fairly recent. Uh, uh, then we produce hydrogen by electrolysis. And then, uh, well, we could, could use the hydrogen as fuel. We, could, we can also uh, uh, combine uh, the hydrogen with carbon, uh, directly from carbon dioxide. And the easiest, uh, well, yeah, the, the best fuel to make as electric fuel is methanol. And from methanol, we can produce other fuels like gasoline, uh, DME, OME. Uh, we could actually uh, use hydrogen and carbon dioxide as syncas and use the well-known Fischer-Tropsch process to produce diesel or gasoline or, or more fuels. Uh, but that is uh, rather inefficient and, and the focus is mostly on methanol as, as, as electrofuel. Well, uh, and uh, one intermediate step further to, to find out how much fuel we can make in Iceland. Uh, I looked at how efficient these processes are and uh, the electrolysis of uh, water to, into hydrogen is fairly efficient. Charging of uh, batteries is very efficient, but producing liquid fuels uh, is like 50% efficient at best and we get down to just over 35% for some fuels. Uh, then uh, a big part of the thesis was trying to estimate how much uh, feedstocks we have for production of fuels. And there are basically two energy sources in Iceland uh, electricity as intermediate 
source of energy. And uh, also biomass. Uh, and then for relative fuel production, we need carbon dioxide. So um, I just made, I made up scenarios uh, where we say that for ele electricity, um, we could take, uh, yeah, well, I say we could take up to uh, uh, 47 terajoule of electrical energy per year, uh, either by uh, building new power plants, uh, or we can take this from existing power production, but that would mean uh, uh, closing down, uh, well, more than half of, of current uh, uh, aluminium smelters and silicon uh, metal uh, factories. So, so this is a very large number, but uh, this this is like potential feedstock for pr production over for over decades. So, so this is also well a theoretical exercise. Um, then. If we are thinking about electric fuels, we need carbon dioxide, dio carbon dioxide, and we can get that from exactly the same aluminium smelters and uh, uh, silicon uh, metal factories, or we could take this from the atmosphere by carbon capture, which is uh, more costly. Uh, and then I looked at potential biomass uh, uh, resources in Iceland. And this, uh, this hasn't really been studied a lot. Uh, but uh, uh, we have a, a lot of landmass in Iceland. And I, I made a scenario where we take 16% of the landmass, 16,000 square kilometers, and use this to grow uh, uh, just grasses and make hay, hay in hay fields, and we grow uh, forests, we can grow lupin, uh, rapeseed, and I also looked at uh, algae, and actually uh, only macroalgae or seaweed that we can grow in the sea. Um, there's not a lot I, I uh, estimated that could be grown this way. And I skipped microalgae because uh, it's definitely too costly to grow for, for biofuels. And then uh, we have about well, we have some bio waste, but that is much less than could be, be grown as energy crops. So I say that, or I state that we can get over 100,000 terasule of energy in biomass in Iceland. It would, well, take decades to, to, to grow or, or, or uh, uh, build up this production. So now we are into <clears throat> the fun stuff. The question: uh, How how does the the possible or potential fuel production in Iceland compare to what we're using today? And if we take this electricity, electricity that we assume we can get 47 terajoule. If we produce uh, electric fuels from this, we can just about produce the fuels that we need today. 
uh, uh, but if we produce hydrogen or charged batteries, we get more because of the higher efficiency. And remember, this is both for cars and ships. Uh, and uh, the usage is about the same for cars and ships today in Iceland. But this is, uh, uh, as we know, uh, battery electric cars, they use, they are more, much more efficient. So uh, also fuel cells cars that use hydrogen. So we should really uh, uh, convert this energy stored into how far we can drive on this energy. So uh, if we assume that uh, battery electric vehicles are three times more efficient than uh, vehicles with the old combustion engine, uh, the picture is different. If we put in the same 47 terajoule of energy uh, and produce methanol from it, we can drive as far as we are doing today. But if we produce hydrogen and use it in uh, fuel cell vehicles, we can uh, drive more than double that of what we are doing today. And if we use battery electric vehicles, we only need part of these 47 terajoules to drive what we are driving today. So we have to keep this in mind when we think about. Uh, uh, so can I, can I just interject with a point there, which I think we've discussed. Yeah. Um, and what's quite interesting at this point, when we look at it, we think to ourselves, great, batteries are the answer. It's all there. Yeah. But there's more to it than that. Uh, as we've proven, uh, batteries are great when you don't have to move them. And they're really great when you, you don't have to move them very far. Yeah. Now, in, in favor of that, you have information like, for example, the fact that 80% um, 80 of all, all car journeys are less than three kilometers, which is a strong yeah. argument in favor of batteries. Mm -hmm. The arguments against it are that, for example, the, um, the effective range from a battery is reduced by at least 30% when you go to cold countries like Iceland. Ah, uh, yeah, good point. Uh, and one of the interesting ones, which really applies to a pragmatic real world model, uh, and particularly in um, in in uh, Europe and in the in the UK and, and when you get into cities, the thing about battery vehicles is that you have to recharge them. Now, being able to recharge them means that you have to plug them in. When you plug them in, you have to have somewhere where you can put the vehicle basically right next to your house, either on your driveway. Uh, or in your garage or something like that. Now, in most European cities, and I know for a fact that in, in almost all British cities, um, firstly, the, um, the, 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 the proportion of vehicle ownership is much lower in cities anyway. But also, the proportion of people that can actually park outside or close enough to their homes to be able to get a power cable to the car is extremely small which is why some cities in the UK are now treating the curbside itself. So the sidewalk alongside the house, they've realized that that is a resource that, that needs to be measured and can be sold out. So um, they're thinking about doing things like putting recharging stations in, um, in street lamps. So that you have, if you have a street lamp outside your house, you then buy access to the curbside recharging station from the local authority. So it's a real, these factors, they complicate the, the battery vehicle picture in both directions. Exactly. Yeah, and uh, so finishing this uh, with uh, uh, the biofuel uh, uh, angle of this, the uh, just over 100,000 terajoule of, of biomass energy can be converted to converted to biofuels with 50% or less 
uh, efficiency, but still we have enough biofuels potentially for uh, for uh, our current needs. Uh, or even double that. So, so that that way is is uh, quite possible for energy transition in Iceland. So, the, the the result from this thesis is that well, anything is possible in Iceland. We have uh, uh, energy resources uh, for. Uh, like four main ways of, of, of uh, energy for transport. It's batteries, no problems there, except for these uh, <laughs> infrastructure problems. We can produce uh, electrofuels, and we actually uh, produce uh, methanol uh, in Svartsenki. Hydrogen uh, is being produced and has been produced earlier this century and last century also. And biofuels, and uh, we're actually producing uh, bio uh, diesel in Iceland and methane, Sorpa in, in Reykjavik produces methane, a lot of it. So <laughs> the result from this thesis is that there's really no problem in, in the energy transition in transport. So from this, uh, 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 the idea of Brenny. Uh, can, I, can I go back was, a bit? Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I, I just want to very briefly summarize this slide, if I may, because I think for me, there's one big takeaway point that that, that I've learned from this, uh, and that is that, and we, we have a precedent for this as we look around, but I think it's really clear that the future of energy is, is not going to be simple. It's going to be a hybrid model, and it's going to be a hybrid model because we know that the different applications of the energy demand different sources. And when I say we have a precedent for that, um, one of the biggest things that shocked me when I came back to the UK five years ago was that farmers now don't just make make cows or wheat, they make electricity. So um, the National Mapping Agency of the UK has had to introduce a new symbol onto its maps for solar farms because solar farms are, are a, a very viable thing. And in fact, it was, I think, a year ago, two years ago that the UK had its first day in which the proportion of electricity from uh, renewable sources went over 50 percent and this last summer because of the combined effect of covid uh, lowering demand and because we had a very um, uh, very sunny summer here we went i think it was either two weeks or a month where the proportion of renewable was was over 50 percent so that's there already and we combine that with the fact that um the infrastructure in the uk for refu for uh, recharging electric cars is building up strongly it is now possible to drive a thousand kilometers in the UK in an electric vehicle. Um, a lo awful lot of domestic houses have solar power on them and people are just starting to take up uh, domestic power storage in the form of very, very large batteries that get fitted into the house to take advantage of the fact that it's incredibly efficient and it doesn't need to be moved. So I think it's really safe to say that the future is gonna be a hybrid approach there. Yeah, exactly. But, uh... What uh, we think is missing in Iceland is a uh, focus on biofuels. So our vision is to, to somehow build uh, a biofuels industry in Iceland. And our aim or vision is that it can be 200,000 tons per year of biofuels. Uh, it is, doesn't need so much land, land mass. It's realistic. Uh, and we want to focus on drop-in biofuels uh, that, that does, do not need new uh, vehicles. Um, obviously domestic or Icelandic feedstock and we want this, this to be 100% carbon neutral. 
uh, yeah, and uh, uh, because of the service life of, of vehicles, that uh, the new vehicles today, they will, they will be on the, on the street for 15 or 20 years to come. So there will be market for uh, uh, these conventional fuels for decades to come. And uh, electric cars, they are typically small uh, urban cars. So, or, or for urban use. So uh, what is totally missing is uh, uh, new fuels for uh, for ships and for aviation. So we think that there is uh, a big market for for dropping biofuels uh, for decades to come. Um, yeah, would you like to add to that, Tim? Yeah, one of the things that I find. Um most interesting about this is that whilst European governments are shouting very loudly about um, killing off internal combustion engine vehicles, for example, the UK has just made an announcement that it's it's not going to be legal to, to sell uh, an internal combustion engine um, passenger vehicle after uh, 2030. Uh, that's that sounds really scary and it sounds like there would be no market for it. But this this picture clearly shows us that the demand is still there because passenger vehicles are only a small proportion of land transport and land transport is only a small proportion of a much larger, um, a much larger entire demand for this. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also in the picture, I think, I mean, it's easy to criticize the government, but one, one of the things that the, they, don't talk about is the inherent efficiency in the drop-in fuel model. In other words, um, it's not, you know, it's carbon, it's carbon neutral, if not carbon negative, and it doesn't demand any energy or investment or any carbon release in the form of building up the infrastructure to make it work. Exactly. Well, uh, this is just the, the technology we are focusing on. It's a new form of paralysis. I uh, don't think we need to go much into details here. This is uh, a scary picture, isn't it? It's a delightfully scary picture. Yeah, uh, you can just look into this HTL process. Uh, it's a lot of... A lot can I make a couple of quick comments on that one? Just go back. Yeah. Um, so one of the, there, there are two big observations that I take away from this. Um, one is kind of uh, liberating and the other one is terrifying. <laughs> so, the, so the liberating one is, I don't know if you can use your mouse pointer on the screen, but if you, if you point at where it says slurry, so what we do is we take in biomass, we add water to it and we grind it down so that you get slurry. Now that's the point at which what we've made there is basically a, a, a recycling plant, plant, which is gathering biomass, turning it into a usable form. That is a recycling plant. Now, if you take your pointer and then point to where it says stable oil down at the bottom right there. Yeah. What you've got there is the point at which our output is effectively um, uh, no different whatsoever from the output of the of the traditional hydrocarbon industry. In other words, it's crude oil, which then goes on and where it says hydrocracking and distil uh, distillation there, that's us throwing it at existing oil refineries and then you get out of it the products that you want. So really the bit that we're focusing on here is the middle of the process. So you kind of borrow the recycling infrastructure, um, borrow the uh, the existing refinery infrastructure uh, and then the clever bit is the bit in the middle. Now the terrifying bit is if you go to the HTL reactor at the top right, yeah. um, we were discussing this the other night and we said hang on a minute, okay so we're going to take some stuff, we're going to increase it to 3000 psi and we're going to heat it to over 300 degrees C. What we're doing there is we're making a very expensive, very very tightly controlled bomb. 
which is where the which is where the safety aspect of this comes in. Yeah. Um, Thorsted has a question for us. Uh, yeah. Can we answer that question at the end? Is that okay? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll keep that window open and we'll we'll take that question at the end if that's okay. So, um, yeah, it's a. I don't fully understand this because I'm not a biochemist, but it's basically take the raw materials, um, take them to a point where chemical reactions are going to take place, put the right bits in there, and then you get the right product out the other end, and off it goes into the um, into the already established um, refinery process. Mm -hmm. um, uh... The state of the technology is actually uh, uh, moving forward. Uh, there are several, uh, well, um, mainly two companies that claim to be leaders in this. And there's this high flex fuel research project that is very interesting. You should look it up. Uh, yeah the can i go back a step sorry to interrupt again can yeah. i go back a step now when we first started discussing the potential competition i was a little bit disheartened and a little bit intimidated by the fact that other people were ahead of us <clears throat> and it's worth mentioning for the for the people on this meeting that we after a bit of conversation we realized that iceland has a couple of unique advantages in this business model so let's say for example i mean the, the best case would be uh Lysella holdings over in australia if they suddenly announce tomorrow that, that they, they've got a fuel or they've got a source of, uh, of gasoline or diesel, which has come from this process, uh, they would not represent a competitive threat to Iceland because the cost of transporting uh, that fuel to Iceland immediately makes it non-competitive. And even if they wanted to come and set up shop and make a, make a production facility over here, the, the simple geography makes it prohibitive and that applies to even even the guys in Denmark and Canada so so the physical isolation of Iceland the North Atlantic is our ally basically it's a <laughs> it's a barrier to anybody getting into the market and the other thing of course is that we've already discussed that this is an electricity intensive process it's going to take a lot of energy to go into it and the reason why you've got aluminium smelters in Iceland and the silicon industry is that energy is is so incredibly cheap in Iceland that it, it makes sense to, to to move stuff across. So Iceland is uniquely placed in in having this combination of the North Atlantic as a defensive wall and basically very cheap energy to, to run the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, this not, doesn't need much discussion except that uh, it's a uh, using uh, organic waste is an opportunity and uh, because that is free or people would even pay us for using it, uh, uh, taking it from them but other, other than that we can use just any organic uh, material as, as feedstock and well electricity not shown here uh, for the for the production and the products are mainly fuel but also fertilizer and carbon dioxide but that's neutral that's that's modern carbon um, yeah if are we we are maybe limited on time mm -hmm. so yeah and of course, this will be sustainable agriculture, uh, so-called uh, second generation biofuels. So uh, the, 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 the sources should not compete with food production. Um, synthetic fertilizer and pesticides are not allowed in the production. And uh, yeah, and with uh, fertilizer production, we, we circulate nutri nutrients, plant nutrients. And there is also a possibility to, uh, with this agriculture, e increase soil carbon. And in that way, we are uh, sequestering uh, atmospheric carbon in the, in the, in the soil. 
so the the fuel could could be uh, uh, carbon negative actually um yeah the cost um uh, 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 this uh, this has been investigated and we are thinking about a uh, us dollar per per liter liter is the production cost and then we have to add uh, uh, the cost of biomass feed uh, which uh, the amount of biomass needed depends on the efficiency of the process and therefore the the high efficiency is very important um, yeah 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 isn't, this, and, isn't it safe to say this is one of our big questions yeah it's, it's basically one of the big questions even yeah. if the whole thing's work works and even if we can get enough biomass and even if we can get the 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 final products certified to the right standards for um for use in in their target environment is it going to be cheap enough yeah that's, that's a big question. Yeah, that, that, that's, that, that's actually what we are really working on now mm. is the, the, the economic and, and investment aspect mm. because mm. we won't get investors to join us if, if the, the selling price of the, the fuel is too high. Mm. Um, yeah, that leads us to our plants. So we would like, uh, it would be nice to have a small scale testing facility uh, or a laboratory just to work with the technology. And this is the one we're referring to as a garage scale project, isn't it? And yeah. although, although I think given that we're going to be building a high quality bomb, maybe a domestic garage is not a good idea. Exactly. <laughs> So yeah, so this is uh, yeah, but this is the the current problems we are facing. This is this problems like this. Where do we put this? And uh, uh, and should should we do a small scale testing? Should we buy it from uh, steeper energy, uh, the technology, and just trust there? Uh, test setup and just go straight into a pilot plant um, <clears throat> a 2000 tons per year plant uh, using free bio waste as feedstock uh, the investment would be about 6 million euros uh, as we estimate and then we just have to get some people to give us six million euros. Just That's like easy. that. That's <laughs> easy. Yeah. And then uh, in the future, when, when we've shown that this is possible, then we'll go on to uh, bigger production. So our challenges, Tim, coordinator, what? What yeah, we got a lot to do. Yeah. I mean, one of the, one of the things that we haven't you haven't listed on this slide is yeah. is basically um, answer all the questions and, and, and keep us going forward. And we are taking an agile approach because we know that we're not going to know that this is succeeding and, until we're quite a long way forward. Until we've until we've got positive answers to all the questions. But to be able to answer the questions, we need to do a lot of these things. We need to build a team. We need to be able to sell the ideas. It's never going to go any, anywhere until we can find the investors. And we're not going to know it's going to work until we've implemented the process. Um, it can't work unless we know how to source the feedstock. Um, and even if everything else works, it's useless unless we can um, market and sell the fuel. And, and of course, along with marketing and selling, we've got the whole question of how on earth do we change it from what is effectively crude oil to a final product? So. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there are no oil refineries in Iceland, mm -hmm. so that in itself is a massive challenge. If it's going to be a if it's if it's going to be a, a truly domestic product, then we'd need need to build an oil refinery in Iceland. Now, I'm not an expert in PR or politics, 
But that's potentially quite a tricky thing to sell to the public. The fact that you're building an oil refinery in what claims to be one of the greenest countries in the world. So that, that's, that's a tough challenge. Uh, yeah. And then, of course, there's, there's safety in production and storage. Um, and uh, I, I'm acutely aware of the whole certification thing. With, with a background in aviation, I know that aviation fuels are both complex. They are a really big blend of a lot of ingredients. And the certification standards for, for the final fuel and for the handling um, and, and storage of aviation fuels are really, really high, quite rightly so. So uh, that could easily end up being a part of the process that either makes um, the whole thing prohibitively expensive or perhaps completely blocks off the avenue of, uh, of aviation fuel for now. We, might, we may have to accept the fact that that's, that's a vertical that we, we simply can't service. So it's a true research project in in that we are forced to be very agile and answer the questions as, as they come up yeah um uh, yeah this is just steps or, or, or things that we have to that we need mm. money people a uh, place to produce raw materials and uh, how do we sell it mm -hmm. so uh, uh so f for you people, uh, yeah, we, we need to make the group bigger. We need people, but <laughs> we have no money to pay. <laughs> That's what Microsoft said at the start. So uh, our dream is uh, uh, to have a laboratory set up that uh, university people could access. Uh, it would be great to have money to fund research projects. Uh, we welcome student projects. And on the right side, there are some ideas, uh, some problems that we are facing that need uh, looking into. And then hopefully soon we need test pellets. So when we produce the First liters of fuel, who is willing to put it on the cars? And it would be nice to, to build up a community of interested people. Uh, yeah. And, and the ideas for uh, uh, potential uh, student projects are. are endless so just contact contact us uh, i put in the end at the end uh, my uh, email and a link to uh, uh, a web page um, i think we are on facebook too so just contact us uh, uh, for uh, if 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 you're interested in this um i think time is running out so should be got time for a few questions any questions, questions from the audience so thank you very much adelstein and timothy i think this mm -hmm. was a very inspiring uh, presentation um uh, so I, I just want to add to this that Reykjavik university and at the sustainability institute and forum at Reykjavik University is also involved with the SORPA and with um, the Agricultural University and the uh, uh, University of Iceland, where we are trying to, well, we ac applied for uh, funding to RANIS to build up a um, bioenergy research center. And this could, of course, lead to very interesting collaborations between uh, academic institutions like the universities and like your company, your startups, because that's needed, what we need, we need the business side, but we need also the fundamental research. And um, so um, if, I mean, you, you know, these infrastructure funds, they have been set up in three stages and we passed already the second stage. So it could be very probable that we would actually have in next year in, in um, the, this, the, this bioenergy center becomes reality. So this would be really an excellent opportunity for students to get involved, 
directly with your company, looking at life cycle assessment, carbon footprint of the different products that you described, uh, looking at um, uh, business models, um, how does this present itself? Um, I know there are foreign investors currently, um, for example, carbon recycling is, is um, exporting their methanol. Um, mm -hmm. and, and also there are Swiss investors that are, that are looking into producing synthetic methane and want to export it to Switzerland. So there is um, an economic opportunity in there. And especially since you're looking at the domestic market, um, there should be even a more interesting market opportunity for, for the domestic market. So um, there are, I mean, like you say, there are a lot of open questions, but always if you have open questions, there are opportunities, uh, business opportunities, um, uh, um, also engineering opportunities to look into new areas and um, so I can, I would, only, of course, like Anna pre presented also out, we had yesterday a lecture ab about the green deals. Um, biofuels is an important part in the green deals. So this will, will be coming up in the next, next year. Um, in those green deals, they are usually a TRL six and seven level. So you need companies that are looking into uh, um, the actual use of the, of the, um, product so yeah so i think there's a huge potential i see that a student has a question um Asbjorn, maybe you can just unmute yourself and ask a question yes thank you david and thank you very much for for interesting uh, uh, presentation um, i have actually uh, very much in interest in in this this uh, matter uh, uh, and i have often wondering about uh, the the co2 uh, uh, emission from from the uh, aluminium factories and 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 uh, and such such thing, um, and uh, the 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 uh, uh, the program that that uh, the government have have been introducing uh, lately about about carb fix. Uh, um, I'm just wondering if, if it would be possible to to use it for for another thing than than put it in. To the ground, but I am I'm wondering about uh, 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 to 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 uh, capture capture all all the biomass uh, that that you would need. Uh, would it, would that just uh, that part uh, be a, a big big cost? I think, I think a short answer to that is, is we don't know yet. Um, but but we do know a few things um, that are fixed. We we know that there is a process for dealing with green and organic waste um, in Iceland, and we know that for some people it's an opportunity, for some people it's a it, it's a problem to get rid of organic waste. Um, we know that we've had a precedent for people growing crops just for biofuel, like the guy down in Thorvaldseyri. Um, so. That's something that we need to get answers to. Um, I mean, I would hope, to me, it seems obvious, if the process works, we're going to know that the process is working when growing crops specifically for this type of biofuel will make enough money for the farmers that it makes sense to them. Because let's be frank with ourselves, the farmers are not going to grow these crops unless it makes them more money than making it just for hay. What, a, an interesting um side note to this is that i was talking to a farmer in mid wales um last summer and we were talking i was asking him about his hay and his crops and everything that he does he does some forestry uh, he's got a lot of sheep farming but he does hay as well and i said well why do you do the hay is there any money in that he said no there's no money in hay at all i actually lose money on hay but i i i i sell it at a very low price just as a service to the local farming community. Now, if that's a widespread model, which it may not be, but if that's a widespread model, even us paying a little bit to farmers to have them produce hay could be potentially a benefit to them and a really uh, cost-effective source of, of, of uh, biomass for, for, for this entire process. But uh, I'm, I'm not sure if other state has anything more on that, but I think the conversations we've had so far is that it's one of the big questions that we need to answer. Yeah, because it's it's not uh, a business model today to produce energy crops in Iceland. So mm -hmm. this 
it's an industry that has to be developed. Mm. But I think it's possible. And well, I, I guess, I guess, in terms of in terms of using land for energy, the, the practical situation that we see in the UK now is probably a good indication of the economics. In other words farmers are not growing crops they're putting solar panels on their fields which probably tells us something about the the financial output that they're getting from that yeah and we also have to consider the energy used for growing and harvesting energy crops mm. so uh, that's an open issue but um... per personally I, I i'm quite interested by the crossover between other factors as well like for example <clears throat> we know that the iceland has a relatively in fact a very low proportion of its land mass which is which is able to be cultivated in a in a traditional sense but also what's very interesting is that we know that we have a project which is about rebinding the soil with the lupins and that's been very successful and we also know that there's a big project for reforestation in iceland so those to me seem like obvious tie-ins yeah uh, icelandic forests uh, forests uh, are do not produce very good uh, wood, but excellent wood for 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 this process. Mm, mm. Yeah. Any more questions? Thank you for that. I can um, I can ask one. So um, I'm originally from Brazil, and in mm -hmm. Brazil, as you said, we have ethanol as a biofuel, mm -hmm. um, which. On the beginning of it was basically a throwaway excess byproducts that was then created into an actual fuel. But now uh, they have plenty of crops of sugarcane to create the ethanol. Um, and sugarcane is not a sustainable crop. It destroys the soil. Um, uh, so yeah. you have big parts of forest being deforested to create uh, fields of sugarcane to produce ethanol so mm. the the sustainability of it is actually a little bit off if if i'm honest mm. and um, how are they using the ethanol does it demand changes to infrastructure i mean is ethanol a drop-in fuel in that context yeah so we have we have ethanol motors in brazil so most car, okay. you actually have you actually have what they call flex cars where you have alcohol yeah. and ethanol um and sorry um gasoline and ethanol as um usability that ethanol sounds a little bit like the lpg cheaper. scenario yeah ethanol is much cheaper and volkswagen mm. brazil in brazil has been i guess the biggest push for ethanol use mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. But basically what I'm trying to, to get at is that I know you're saying that you have, see the possibility of having crops in Iceland, um, but there is a, a, a major issue with um, food shortage in Iceland where you have to import so much food. And if there is a possibility of creating crops one versus the other, don't you think that is going to be a bit of an issue uh, being able to s sell that idea as, as fuel crops? We, because- We did discuss that, didn't we? Um, um, I, I think- I can't remember what the numbers were, but I seem to remember the conversation went along the lines of we can't let the people starve. And you said, don't worry, I've done the numbers. <laughs> well, this is no problem in Iceland. Uh, most of land is uh, just not used for anything at all. So mm. it's uh, used a lot of land is used for very, very inefficient uh, meat production so and and yeah uh, the vegetation of Iceland used to be like 40% of the land mass uh, so yeah uh, reclaiming of soil and, and vegetation is goes hand in hand with, with uh, increased uh, uh, cultivation of energy crops yeah we also know as interesting but, but of course we have to uh, always uh, look at the sustainability issues mm. but in my opinion it will not be a problem and and uh, yeah i have, I have yeah. one comment to make adelstein i think mm. the the ideas are great and i am fully um, are supportive of it and i think it shows really a lot of innovation that they, that is available here um, you might also think of the social acceptance. Um, I mean, you mm -hmm. say that, um, you know, the farming community, um, sheep farming is, has a very strong lobby. 
Um, yeah. mm. And you might think of this as well. And also, I think you mentioned that you would like to um, vegetate some of the areas with lupin, which is also uh, <laughs> a bit... Um, controversial. Um, polit- yeah. yeah, it's controversially discussed. So, but obviously, um, big changes require um, new ideas. And um, this could also be a project where students can look into what is the social acceptance of uh, making a shift like this, what is possible and what uh, is simply not possible because it will socially not be accepted. Mm. Uh, mm. So you could, I, I know your numbers are very, um, um, very uh, uh, um, ambitious <laughs> yeah. to put it that way. And, and but um, I think it, it, it's a first start and we can then go into it, look into more detailed, what are sensitive areas where uh, um, there will be a lot of opposition, what are areas are impossible. And so this could be a, a really nice uh, a student project. I mean, in, 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 the, in the extreme case, in your last slide, if it's incredibly successful, you could get an extreme case where countries around the world Instead of instead of paying a lot of money to move their their aluminium ore to Iceland, countries would be paying a lot of money to move their biomass to Iceland (laughs) because they're going to get cost effective fuel out of it and they get they get the opportunity to offload loads of carbon. Okay, but I mean, just have to mention that similar ideas of using biofuels exist in other countries as well. So but none but none of them have the, the North Atlantic as a force field. (laughs) <laughs> the north atlantic works in both ways i know yeah. i'm just i'm just being positive i had strong coffee this morning so i'm being really optimistic i think it's great to be positive i'm just pointing it out and of course these yeah, are yeah. interesting aspects um, one of one of the things i learned after 12 years of of, of being in iceland was to w- was to think like an icelander and i always i always just think to myself yeah, yeah that, that, that. <laughs> <laughs> okay very good. Uh, one question. Uh, yeah. By by, uh, uh, Rechta, what is this? Uh, to cultivate. Cultivate. Thank you. Uh, uh, a biomass and and then burn it. Uh, is is that a good solution for uh, the? Um, I, I'm I'm wondering about about the, the greenhouse effects and and that. Uh, if 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 you are uh, if you are uh, uh, yes, agriculture, uh, uh, a biomass to burn it and and make uh, more. Mm. Do you understand my question? Yo. Well, that, that that carbon is is neutral because it comes from the atmosphere and we just burn oh, it. Oh yes, yes, of and course. It, it. It, it's the digging up dead dinosaurs that's the problem. Yeah, <laughs> um, I might mention um, Sorpa is producing um, 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 methane from from the waste. So I think the first option would be to look into the waste streams. Um, you have different yeah. waste streams from food waste to um, you know household waste to even sewage treatment plants or sewage water, which is a well, big it, issue. It's in interesting Iceland. that you mention that because. Um because we were discussing this and you were talking about the uh, the the. the um, the sort of the marketing and the, and, and the perceptions of this. Now, one of, one of the high volume, very reliable sources of organic matter that we have is human waste. Yeah. Now, of, of all the things that, you know, of course, and in fact, interestingly, there was an explosion just down the road here in, in Bristol last week um, at a plant. It was a huge, great tank at a sewage treatment plant that was doing exactly this. It was, it was, it was taking human human solid waste from the sewage treatment process and using it to produce gas. So there is a precedent for, for part of this, but um, it's a bit of a tough sell. So Drive your car so, on poo. But it, this already exists. Many sewage treatment yes. plants in, in Central Europe have um, methane biogas reactors producing mm. methane for, for, for energy use. Mm. And the, the good thing, about, well, the interesting thing about it is if you argue that the carbon footprint of the of the of the waste um, treatment goes to the goes to the actual waste treatment. So to do the cleanup of the, or, or the, the production of the sewage treatment plant, then you can have a negative carbon footprint on the exactly. methane because of the carbon is already allocated to the process of 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 treating this, the, the wastewater. 
Yeah, so exactly. and then then you could have a, a, um, a fuel that is actually from a carbon budgeting point of view very interesting. Um, yeah, so, I think I think this is yeah. also one of the sort of one of the marketing issues that is going to be um, a challenge around this, because people tend to think in extremely simplistic terms and they think internal combustion engine is bad because it pollutes and it's got a bad carbon footprint. But mm -hmm. it's it's critically important that people understand that carbon is not carbon and and. It, it, the problem is when you release carbon that shouldn't have been released anyway. And, and that, that's a critical point of understanding. It might be beyond the stretch of some people, but, you know, more complex ideas have been sold to the public before. Yeah. So it should, in and, theory, be possible. And the further aspect you might, that, that you might investigate into, um, if you use methane and you burn it, uh, you get a, a, very, a very efficient um, burning process. Yes. You produce yes. mostly a, a CO2 and a, maybe a water vapor and some trace mm. elements. While if you produce, if you burn um, conventional diesel, you produce lots of nitri nitrogen oxides, um, carbon hydrogen mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. emissions, volatile organic components, which are very toxic. And you could actually argue that besides having a lower carbon footprint, that you also have a uh, um, cleaner vehicles running in the city, which is which is an emerging issue in Iceland as well. You always have these. It is, yeah. These, but uh, in, interestingly, there are there's kind of a layer. What I find fascinating is the way that the pure logic and the pure science doesn't finalize the the eventual outcome on this. And if you look at fuel cell vehicles, they are a classic example. So there were fuel cell buses running in Iceland back in two thousand and three, two thousand and four. But yet we and, and you would when you look at it, they would make they would appear to make perfect sense because uh, the fuel is incredibly cheap. They are incredibly efficient and the only output is water vapor. So they sound like the perfect solution. Yet when you look at it, the world is not full of fuel cell vehicles. And we have to ask ourselves the question, in spite of the fact that the technology is, is beautiful and efficient, why is that? And well, there are other reasons like it's it's very expensive to do, although the other night we discovered that was it Toyota? That are actually selling a fuel cell vehicle to the public right now. Yeah, in um, too. <laughs> yeah, indeed. So, I, it, it, you get these weird situations where a perfect solution, even though it's a perfect solution, might not survive contact with economic and social rules and laws and norms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, game I, changers are always hard to um, to 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 make them socially accepted. Indeed. Uh, I mean, there, there are a lot of interests in keeping the situation like it is, but it needs to, you know, it needs people like you who just try to start it or also like Anna, who is trying to set up a circular economy mm. in, in Iceland. So, mm. but I think it's also, again, just maybe to point this out again, if anyone, any one of the students is interested in, in getting in contact with you or with Anna, um, the previous speaker, um, feel free to do so. And I think these are uh, great student projects um, which could maybe even lead to something that is um, going beyond a simple master thesis. <laughs> and you can yeah, so, so at the moment we're having, um, we're having our end of, end of sprint meetings every Tuesday evening at a time to be determined based on when my son goes to bed. Um, but there is there is one there are there are kind of two constant factors on on our end of sprint meetings. We will always review what we completed in the previous sprint. We will always discuss what we're doing over the next sprint. Uh, and your attendance is, it, it has to be accompanied by you either drinking a beer or a glass of whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> May I come with up with with one uh, more question? Yeah, yeah no. Um, as far as I remember, there is a. Uh, 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 pr pr production in Akureyri that, that is producing biodiesel, isn't it? Right, yeah. remember. Yeah. Uh, how have you uh, looked at that? that how, how that that goes there? Uh, how how that project? Didn't you talk to them? Yeah, it's very interesting. It's uh, they use uh, waste cooking oil mostly and produce biodiesel. And it's mostly used in ships in, in Akureyri. And uh, I'm not sure if they are also using uh, slaughterhouse fat. Uh, and, and in Akureyri, they are 
they have big ideas about uh, uh, a biorefinery. They, they, they blend, blend it with, with uh, uh, fossil. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So they're considering building a little mini refinery up there, are they? Yeah, ba based on uh, uh, biodiesel, and uh, they also have, uh, they are starting, uh, well, they have a methane production too. And mm. they want to combine this and, and uh, develop. Well, that, that sounds great. Let's just use their refinery and they, they can deal with the whole marketing problem about building the refinery. And mm -hmm. we'll just pump our output into them and pick it up at the other end. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? Any question? If there are no more questions, I would like to thank the two spe the three speakers. Um, was it, was it, I think you were really nice presentations. Maybe we can um, give them a virtual applause by <laughs> clicking on this link. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. <laughs> That's the quietest round of applause I've ever had. But thank you yes. very much. <laughs> so thank you again. Um, I will be close the meeting yet. Uh, close the, the lecture for this morning. Um, but of course, we will be stay in touch and hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. Thanks Have a nice time, afternoon. everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.